It's time to begin the final gauntlet. I load everyone up with the best weapons I can buy and use some stray stat boosters before the final leg of the game. The gimmick of Chapter 20 is a near endless stream of monster reinforcements. Crossing certain areas of the map will trigger proximity reinforcements, and regular reinforcements can arrive as late as turn 28. Given the completely absurd quantity of enemy reinforcements, it's a good idea to find a shortcut to the center of the map and kill the boss, ending the chapter early. Not only will that save us some tedium, it's going to save some durability on our good weaponry. I can easily kill the boss by flying in Myrrh, but I'm going to have to get Erica there to seize the gate to actually end the chapter. My goal is to send my army to the southern part of the map. Once I've cleared out the enemies near the boss, I'll have Cyrene fly in Erica's to seize the gate. All S-rank weapons, well, minus the Dark Tome, have an effective damage multiplier against monsters. Even Amelia can get kills on tough monsters here, given that the Vidofnir counts as an effective 32 might weapon. And since Marissa hit S-rank sword in the last chapter, she can use the S-rank sword to great effect as well. I've given Nime the bow for obvious reasons, and as always, Ross is wielding the Garm. There's still a high number of centaurs charging in from the top, as well as the monsters I have to deal with on the south. However, all of the centaurs have a fairly poor hit rate given that they use weapons such as steel axes. Since this chapter has plenty of defensive terrain available, pretty much any of my fast units can dodge tank that at zero risk. In fact, many of the enemies in this chapter aren't very dangerous, making the chapter feel like kind of a victory lap. The enemy stats and weaponry are generally inferior to those powerful promoted enemies we had to fight in chapter 19. Also, they're easy to one-shot using our S-rank weapons. We also have a hammer and staff if we need to prepare any of our S-rank weapons as well. I'm going to let Yuen and Nime dodge tank the centaurs. While Nime isn't on the forest, she can use weapon triangle advantage and support bonuses to reach even higher of void than Yuen has on the forest. Pause. What the hell was this? Turns out that guy had a sword slayer. Also, he ran over a forest tile without even slowing down. He's a mounted unit. What even happened here? Anyway, I get lucky and killed the guy. Marissa definitely dodged a lethal blow for that, though. I know that Reaver-type weapons reverse the weapon triangle and double the effects, but I can't believe that guy had such a high hit rate on Marissa. The guy that attacked Nime had a 0% hit rate. I feel like someone pulled a prank on me. Anyway, the danger's passed, so let's keep moving. I'm actually not very far from the boss in this point of the map, but the thickets, mountains, and lakes are inaccessible to most units. You need flyers. I'm sending in Murr to do my dirty work. She has about 20 uses left on her Dragonstone? We'll have to see if they last. I'm expecting an obnoxious quantity of monsters to spawn around the boss and from the left side of the map, so it's still useful to send the rest of my army to the lower half of the map to try and draw some of them away from Murr. There's also still Cyclopses coming in from the north end of the map, and I'm going to have to deal with Gargoyles from the upper right corner. I'm going to send Ewan alone to deal with it. He's got very high avoid when on a forest, and I kind of want to grind his dark rank to S rank before the game's over. Also, I just think it would be funny if we got him a few more levels. I've never heard of anyone seriously using this unit for combat in a no grinding playthrough due to how difficult it is to get him started, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Murr is within a few tiles of the boss, so it looks like I might actually be done with the chapter quickly. This is the point where the warp staff would be really, really handy if we had one. While Murr is invincible, she can't retaliate to range, and she gets swarmed by magic using enemies and can't move forward. Our only other flyer is Cyrene, whose job is to be Erika's uber driver and nothing else. It's going to take Murr several turns to slog through this horde of enemies just to move four tiles to the boss. I'd like to conserve Murr's dragonstone uses, but she's getting swamped by enemies. I'm going to try and lure the Death Goyles down south towards Ross, and I'm going to try and use phantoms to lure some of the Mogols south, where I can pick them off with my other units like Nime. Given the slightly awkward situation, most of my army can't really do anything. Except for Ewan. Ewan's throwing a party up north. He's having a great time. Even if he does take a hit, I'll just switch to Nosferatu tanking. Look at him go. I'm so proud of our boy. Well, there's no need to worry about Ewan, so let's check back in on Murr and see how she's doing. She's getting swarmed by so many enemies that they've actually body blocked the bishop who's forced to attack at melee range. Hilarious. We pan back to Ewan who's killing about 70 gargoyles per turn. This actually gets him S rank dark. Nice. Keep in mind, the S-Rank Dark Tome is kind of a joke weapon. It weighs 20, and it doesn't have an effective damage multiplier against monsters in the final bosses like every other S-Rank weapon in the game. What's the deal? I'm going to try to use it anyway because, well, it's funny. Murr is but two tiles from the boss at this point. Hopefully I can divert some of the Mogols to attack Amelia and Gilliam. Thinking back on things, I promoted Natasha way back in Chapter 12 with the idea of training her light rank and using her against monsters in the late game because bishops have effective damage against all monsters. I'm not really doing it. 
I have plenty of units that can fight monsters just fine. Also, her stats aren't very good. To be honest, my healers pretty much never see combat. Murr is still completely surrounded by Mogals because they've made the intelligent decision to attack Murr who has 35 res as opposed to Amelia who has, I don't know, 9? I've cleared out enough of them by this point that I'm finally ready to airdrop in Erica. I might be able to clear the chapter next to her if Murr can take out the boss in one round. Ewan has ran out of things to do, so I'm just having him solo the top half of the map until the chapter's over. Some of the enemy death goyles are rushing towards Erica, but I can distract them with phantoms if I need to. I'm interested to see how well Murr does against the boss. As it would turn out, Murr can't quite one round the boss. She can't double and doesn't deal enough damage to one shot. I'll have to brawl the boss in enemy phase and finish it off on player phase. I can't take two hits because the boss does a set 37 points of damage no matter how high your defense is. While Murr is fine at 5 HP, the rest of the monsters can't damage her, it's frustrating to have to expose her to those skeletons on the left. This is going to burn through pretty much the entire remainder of her Dragonstone. While Murr has been absolutely essential to doing this chapter in a way that isn't incredibly frustrating, we're going to have to leave her out of final. She simply won't have any Dragonstone uses left by this rate. But I think I'm fine with that. I think it's going to be more entertaining to fight the bosses of a horde of my low tier units, as opposed to just throwing Murr at it. Murr is more or less a super weapon while she still has gas in the tank. And it won't make for as satisfying a conclusion if we just throw Murr the soul of the final boss as opposed to using the units we've been training all game. Also, the deploy limit for final is kind of tight. It drops it back down to the usual 12 deploy, but forces us to bring Ephraim. I'm going to have to drop Murr, Cyrene, Renick, and Dazla. The final chapter has begun. Outside of the enemy Draco zombies and Gorgons, the rest of the enemies are fairly non-threatening, just regular skeletons using steel weapons. I'm not sure why the designers put such non-threatening enemies in the final chapters of the game, particularly because FE6 and FE7 have some pretty strong climaxes. I mean, the final bosses in those games are pretty bad actually, but the filler enemies pose a serious threat. The final chapter is symmetrical, but there's no actual need to go to both sides of the map, so I dedicate my units to going up just the right side. Even going through the center is a mistake, if you approach the staircase directly in front of the boss, it will trigger a never-ending wave of free skeleton reinforcements per turn, which is not really dangerous, but definitely an annoyance. Ross absolutely demolishes this Draco zombie. Draco zombies are nearly impossible to one round unless your unit is exceptionally powerful. Ross is at his strength cap of a 20 might weapon and he still can't do it. It's possible support bonuses, higher strength caps, and critical hits, but there's only two Draco zombies in the entire game unless you count the boss in the previous chapter, and you only need to fight one of them here. I hear the optional post game has a chapter where they throw like 10 of them at you at once, which is hilarious. With the Draco zombie down, the real threat in this chapter are the Gorgons that surround the boss. They don't move, but two of them use Shadow Shots with fairly high magic stats. We're going to use Phantoms to sponge the damage. My plan involves avoiding the central staircase. I'm going to sneak up the right side of the map and then take out the Gorgons one by one. Once I've made enough room to strike, I can send several units at once to take out the boss. Despite being the final chapter, there are actually treasure chests to loot during this chapter. They contain, hilariously, a Master Seal as well as an Angelic Robe. I actually should have gotten the Angelic Robe, the final bosses hit so hard that some units can't take a single hit without dying. Most of my units have fairly low res, and I believe Leon hit something in the 40s. This chapter can be cleared much quicker if you use a Warp Staff. I believe the strategy involves warping in a boss killer, using some sort of long range staff to heal him, and then warping in a dancer to give your boss killer another shot at Leon. Leon's HP and defense stats are enormous, but pretty much any trained user of the Garm I believe can 4 shot him without a crit. Also, Leon's weapon is extremely heavy. He's very easy to double. Although, I don't regret skipping the Warp Staff in the end. While it was accidental, playing these last few chapters for real has made it feel a bit more legitimate. Just skipping a chapter of a Warp Staff feels a little bit anticlimactic, and I think it's the main problem I have with Shadow Dragon. Actually, I have a lot of problems with Shadow Dragon. That game gives you two Warp Staffs, the ability to repair them, and they have infinite range, and you only need a D rank in order to use them. It's completely ridiculous. But let's go back to talking about FE8. These Death Goyles are the last of the reinforcements I'm going to have to deal with. All that's left are a couple spiders, gorgons, and the boss himself. Only some of my units can damage the boss. S rank weapons have a 2 times damage multiplier against him, and their weapon might ranges from around 16 to 20. My best choice is obviously Ross, but I also have the S rank bow on Nime, the sword on Marissa, and I did give the lance to Amelia, mostly as a joke. I've also got Erica and Ewan. Erica's personal weapon multiplies his damage, but the S rank Dark Tome doesn't. However, it's strong enough that it might do some damage anyway. 
Of the six units I mentioned, only some of them will be able to fight the boss. Unfortunately, Leon one-shots Erica. While I could just have Ross solo the boss over the course of a couple turns, I want to do it in one big, dramatic fell swoop and have multiple units take out the boss. If you're wondering why I'm approaching so slowly, I think the Gorgon on the far left actually moves, and there's two Shadowshot Gorgons who are still alive by this point. I don't want to trip over the finish line and lose a unit to a silly mistake at the very end of the game. However, the time has come, I'm going to move in my entire army. I want to give a big shout out to Noel. Breaking through to the top of the map is kind of annoying if you don't warp skip the chapter because of those two Shadowshot Gorgons. I'd love to see more unique utility classes like Summoners make an appearance in future FE. I feel like there's a lot of open design space in this series for units that have unique utility value. Let's check our damage. Ross can take out the boss in two rounds of combat, but he nearly dies for it and the Gorgons will definitely finish him off. We'll kill Leon next turn. Well, assuming enough units can join Ross in the attack, I've already checked, Erika can't survive a blow of Leon and neither can Nime. I could use them as finishers, however. Ewan has insanely high res at 26 and could easily survive a blow, but can he deal damage? Marissa has 42 HP, so I'm reasonably certain that she can survive a round of combat. I have at least three units here who can engage Leon without dying in return, and I can finish him off with someone else if he's still alive. Let's just do the mental map and check our damage. Ross can deal 38, Ewan can deal 24, yeah, I've got this, I'm actually very impressed with Ewan. His weapon doesn't have an effective damage multiplier, but he can put in a big chunk of damage, much more than Marissa. The incredibly fast Ewan doubles Leon to death despite his 20 weight weapon, and we move on to part 2. Only Erica can reach the Demon King on turn 1. The Demon King does less damage than Leon because his weapon is physical, Erica has just enough HP to survive with one hit point remaining. All of those lucky defense level ups she got came through. I'm not worried of leaving her at 1 HP, I have the s rank staff on Natasha, and it's going to be maybe the first and only time I use it. I have no use for a second phantom, so you tried your best, buddy. The final boss can put people to sleep, but I believe the s rank staff also cures statuses. I'm not going to kill a single one of these monsters, I'm gunning straight for the kill. I've got four open spaces to make melee attacks this turn, and Nime can attack from range as well. You did a great job, Erica. I'm proud of you. Let's get Ross in there. Hit rate shaky, but plenty of damage. 58 damage to the Demon King. What a chad. He'll be easy to finish off now. But who besides Ross is worthy of landing the final blow? I could easily do it with Nime, but she's had too much of a spotlight. Go, Marissa. Chip him down to exactly 2 HP for me. Alright, that's perfect. Who else would be funnier to end our low tiers run than our 13 strength Amelia? They told me Amelia was bad as a general. Well, they were right, but... It doesn't matter. Get his ass, Amelia. For once, I'm finally proud of her. With the final blow struck, the low tiers run is finally over. I'll make a bonus video to do unit reviews of each unit's performance in the run, but for now, that's all I've got for you today. And as always, thank you for watching.